Jen. Hi, Monica. We're back. The third of our of our interviews, talking about philosophy and uh, practical and public uses of philosophy. And um, today we're talking a little bit more about your research work, which is exciting to me because I'm a fan as much as I'm your friend. I'm also really a fan of the kind of work you do. Um, I actually, I'm going to say it, built a course around your work um, on play and Gadamer. Uh, it was a first year, um, first year seminar course called Theories of Play. And um, so it, students were engaging in exercising this idea of play. And um, it was always so nice because in my head, I just kept going like, that's my friend, my friend. And, and so, and, and I always remembered, you know, in grad school when I'd be with a professor and he'd like name drop some philosopher that he knows. And then I realized how much fun it is. <laughs> I'd be like, this is my friend. Like I know this her. This is my friend and colleague. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is also what makes this so good to do and so fun to do because like, you know, this idea of friendship and philosophy is, it, it's a traditional thing that I think we sometimes lose in professional philosophy, which is the idea that philosophy is born out of friendship. Absolutely agree. And I'm honored that you came up with a class, a whole class built on play. And I'm sure I would have loved to have taken that as a freshman. Um, that sounds really, um, you know, off the beaten path and, and cool. So that's awesome that you came up with that. Yeah. Um, and yes, I want to return to some of these roots of philosophy um, where dialogue and friendship are intertwined. And so um, last time we talked a little bit about philosophical counseling, and um, this is kind of where what I'm doing in philosophy these days um, is um, a practical use of uh, dialogue um, and friendship. And so today we're going to kind of do a little throwback to the um, theoretical roots of that practice. Um, yeah. Um, tell us more about yeah. your academic work. And, and again, I, you know, for our audience, um, talking about Plato and Aristotle is something we've always done as part of our philosophical training, but as a lay person or, or not familiar, or maybe never read Plato and Aristotle, it's still really useful, especially as a uh, translation, right? So when people who are trained in reading philosophy and you know, like Aristotle and Plato and that those traditions, we are a point of access. Yeah, I mean, I love going back to Plato and Aristotle as inspiration for, um, you know, philosophy in general, but just my daily problems. So I guess I'll start with, um, you know, talking a little bit about um, friendship. And I think last time I, I said that I use friendship as a model for philosophical counseling, um, that, that it's not, I don't use a medical model for philosophical counseling. I use a friendship model. And um, I probably said this last time, but I'll just say it again to kind of remind us that um, I think a good friend doesn't project their own agenda on you. They want what's good for you, for you, for your sake. Um, they listen and help you deliberate about mm -hmm. what's going to be good for you. Um, they consider different points of view and bring their own ideas to the table. Um, and they help you figure out how to creatively put your own values into action. So on the one hand, they are taking into consideration your individuality and the way that you're different from them and your own goals. But they're also considering like what's good for human, what, what's healthy for human beings mm. in, in, in general. And, um, you know, what's good, what's true, what's just and I think it's important that a good friend consider that as to not just sort of enable your bad habits. We all have bad habits where we just want what we want. And it's good to have someone to challenge that at times if we're like doing something destructive. Um, so I think that um, these this notion of friendship, what a good friend is, I mean, it's rooted not only in just my personal life experience, but also in my study of Plato and Aristotle where philosophy and the philosophical life and 
genuine friendship are really closely connected and intertwined. Mm -hmm. Um, You really can't practice philosophy without a good friend and dialogue partner or two or three um, who who listen to each other, deliberate together in dialogue and care about each other's well-being and care about each other's character and care about truth and yeah. investigating truth together. I think too that the, you know, it's a very modern concept to think that philosophical thinking is this purely individualized reflective activity like Descartes, you know, sitting in his room, contemplating his dreams from reality, kind of speculating on the nature of the universe. I think that is a very relatively modern Western concept of philosophical practice or philosophical thinking and speculative thought, the function of speculative thought is, you know, this very individual attention. And um, also as a student of Hannah Arendt, I, I always think like she, really had to fight that idea that, in fact, philosophical thinking needs to be political thinking, needs to be something that shapes the world anew, right? So that that how much we might need that now as a kind of uh, break from that modern tradition and how it has a hold on us, even in the middle of a pandemic. We're still holding on to these very individuated ideas of thinking and trying to think ourselves out of things that are so complex and so despair inducing that that's what I really find so lovely about philosophical friendship and being able to talk about things that are really meaningful and world, you know, world bearing. It really does have a significance on the world I live in. And I think that's what going all the way back to the Greeks also functions as it's a kind of go back to before the, the Cartesian turn where it was the, I think, therefore I am. You know, and um, that's that's also what I really like about it. So, and, and I know you, and you're, you're not alone in your struggles, like yeah. the notion that I need to meditate alone. I mean, maybe I do sometimes meditate alone, but then I need to talk about it with someone. Yeah. Um, and my struggles aren't just about me and my and my problems. They're worldly problems. Other people have the same problems, or can empathize with your problems and and help you and in, in, you know get into the inquiry about them. Um, yeah, like, let's talk a little bit about play too. Um, so I mean, my, I I feel like, like many philosophers, my philosophical training starts with Plato and Aristotle, but then I, I went on to work on Hans Georg Gadamer's work. He's a contemporary German philosopher. Um, but his work is really rooted in the Greeks, really rooted in, um, Plato and Aristotle. So he's got a philosophy of dialogue that's really rooted in Plato and Aristotle. And I think that Plato and Aristotle's notions of friendship are baked in to his understanding of dialogue. And what, what speaking of play and playfulness, I think what Gadamer really brings to our understanding of dialogue is he recognizes that there's this playful character to dialogue, to a genuine dialogue. It's spontaneous and dynamic and has this kind of lightness to it, this back and forth reciprocal character where the partners become totally immersed in it, like players in a game, like, you know, people shooting hoops or something, totally immersed in it. Um, And the dialogue partners let the subject matter under discussion be their guide and lead kind of lead them around so they give up they give up control in a certain way and they let the the um, subject matter guide them so that the conversation starts to have a life of its own and i think anybody who has good friends that they have conversations with know how these conversations can go on for hours and just you know have a life of their own um but in the process of of being immersed in this dialogue the players the dialogue partners become transformed. They they're transformed by learning from each other, um, by listening to what the other has to say, taking it seriously, um, becoming aware of their own assumptions that maybe they'd like to call into question, and really like with humility, you know, seeking um, answers together. So, it, you know, we become absorbed in this dialogue. And I mean, you can see the example of, you know, Socrates and his dialogues are an example of this kind of philosophical play. Um, But 
it's through the engagement with another over a topic, over a subject matter that we, that both dialogue partners start to broaden their horizons of understanding and learn and grow. And it's this really beautiful picture, I think, of how humans affect each other in their understanding and growth. And it's, it's, it's playful, but it's also serious. Just, mm -hmm. just like um, kids playing, you know, at Harry Potter or something are freaking serious about their roles, you know, and, and, and Gautamer says, if you don't take the game seriously, you're a spoil sport. So you, you, you can't just think of it as like just a game. No, it's real. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's something you're completely involved in and playing the game um, requires certain kinds of, you know, commitments and seriousness. Yeah. I think that's one of the things I did adopt into the coursework was how much the classroom space had lost its playfulness as serious as a as a as a strategy of you know learning and it was a way to change the way students perceive risk in their experience of learning and again not taking it on as like a personal burden like i need to do well on a test kind of yeah. perception but that the classroom space was a kind of like you know field of, of engagement and um, a bit of a sport and a bit of a, um, a back and forth, but that the risk was suspended in one way, which was, you know, when I'm not grading you, I'm not surveilling you, I'm, a, I'm giving you permission and license to kind of be free to say things or do things that maybe you would think that you'd have to filter. Um, and again, it took some of the robotic qualities of a classroom out because then you get students spontaneously just interacting with you. Like it was for them, for the, like that was their space. And technically it is, I mean, you know, it is I their always space. joke about like yeah. your, your tuition money is, <laughs> is supposed to be benefiting you, right? Yeah. It's not supposed to continue to, to withdraw on, on the, on the credit, you know what I mean? And, um, and getting, and getting students to do that with each other was also a very difficult obstacle and, and seeing each other as engaged in a kind of dialectical activity. Um, again, they had been trained to kind of only talk to the teacher as if everything was a dialogue with the authority and that they were in competition with their peers um, for yeah. that kind of attention, for that yeah. valuing, you know, and, and that became very difficult to break because it was so built in as a choreography of expectations. And so coming in with that premise that this is actually going to be where we're gonna exercise both a theory and then put it in and make it pedagogy, make it the classroom, the spirit of the classroom. We're gonna engage in activities that exercise your comfort zone and you're gonna be expanding horizons. But yeah. the idea was, is that we were gonna build back a little joy into like you're in college how fun yeah. you know like, like let's explore uh, ideas like go and be wrong you know like that was yeah. something that I feel like I kind of had to always tell my students too is that this is the space to be wrong let's right. let's be wrong a lot right. so we can try things out and then examine the answers and 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 you know get a better understanding uh, of things like you know dare to be wrong we need a space to right. try stuff out and explore and kind of adventure with these ideas. And, and a lot of that, you know, concept of individual success and winning and that kind of stuff that comes with a lot of the kind of, you know, culture, capitalism and, um, you know, entrepreneurship. Some of that I tried to renegotiate with them with this idea that, again, like failure, you know, playing a game isn't about the winning and losing, right? It's about the engagement and it being fun, right? The character of the event and the quality of the experience was really the goal. And that was hard because again, the training, they had to unlearn in order to be able to, you know, enjoy some of that activity. What's the trade-off? And I think that was really important. I think that's why I really love what you do with Gadamer is there was a really important consent quality in that classroom 
that I found a lot of students had already kind of alienated themselves from. That a lot of what they were doing in college felt like that's what you had to do, that it felt involuntary, that it felt forced. Yeah. And they were being, they were hostile, they were resistant, like they had to be there, or you have to do these things for me, or you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And there was a lot of that, like, you know, preparing oneself to be blamed or try to pass yeah. blame. And, and that's a lot like of a real perversion of play when it's forced or manipulated. It's and that's not, where I've I've done yeah. my work in ableism. And that's one of the characters of ableism is this way in which we pass back and forth shame and blame, right? This is this is like, you're supposed to be able to do this. And if you're not able to do it, then there's something wrong with you, right? And then if, if I didn't do it, then you did it, right? So we pass along shame and blame. And I think suspending that in, in, a, in a real meaningful way and giving a kind of option out of that shame and blame I would say things like to my students, like there's no teacher blaming, no student blaming, no parent blaming in educational environments. Once we stop pointing the fingers about bad teachers or bad students or you know, bad parenting, blame it on mom. Uh, once we stop doing that and how much of education is built to do that, especially in the United States, um, there was this, this was this option that was right there that was supplied with this idea of Gadamer's notion of this dialectical play that we take seriously. That there's nothing about that that's frivolous. So right. it's it's substantial. It's not, you know, just us goofing off, which also yeah. could be a perception with students when you talk about play. Um, the first day of class, I'd come in with Play-Doh, a little thing of Play-Doh, and you had to see them just like, wait, this is college? <laughs> really? Are you are you that de- play deprived? And that was one of the other things I, I, I brought into it is that we live in a play deprived society. We've yeah. lost our, we take something so seriously that and that's what I love about philosophy too, is that it does bring me joy because it is consensual, because it feels like the more I do it, as much as it might be a risk, there is real reward. And the reward isn't a goalpost. It really is this kind of expansion of horizons. But I think there's something really important about just that concept of hermeneutics that I think as a method or as a strategy of doing philosophy, you know, especially those in the analytic tradition of philosophy, they might not, they might not know exactly what the benefit is of doing that kind of the Gadamerian method. Good question. How do we, how do we get into it from a a uh, friendly and not intimidating point of view. Mm. So um, in in this dialogue, in a conversation, in a dialogue, um, um, the partners are um, uh, proposing certain um, points of view based on their own prior experience or study. And it's sort of a first stab at um, an answer to a question that is under consideration. And um, we always come to the conversation with our preconceived notions and we can't, uh, we can't remove them, but what we can do is test them. So we can, we can play them out. So you know, I'm gonna roll the dice here of my uh, preconceived notion about the answer to the question of, a good life or something. I mean, that's really big, but you know, maybe we could get a s- smaller question. But um, uh, and the other person then can can sort of test our test our answer and ask us questions and and in this process of trying out um, preconceived answers to questions, we learn from the other person and we start to revise. We start to you know learn new things and revise our judgments. And, and for, for Gadamer, rooted in his teacher, Heidegger, um, there's this circular uh, uh, character to interpretation where we, you know, we kind of try out our, pre- or they call it prejudice or prejudgment. Mm-hmm. We try out our prejudgment, which doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation. It's just we all start with prejudgments. And then we, we see how our um, our ideas, uh, we kind of see what flies, you know, like what kinds of things in our, what kind of expectations in our prejudgments get thwarted? Um, uh, how do we find out that we're wrong in certain ways and then start to revise our understanding? 
And as we revise our, our, um, our notion of a particular topic, that can have deep effects on our whole like background concept, a uh, background context of understanding too. Sorry, that's really abstract. Um, no, I think I, I, I do. I do think that that's important though to lay out because as much as it's abstract, I think it does, ex it does show how important I think the explanatory power of what Gadamer offers in being able to craft conditions that allow for this kind of dialogical activity. In other words, when we use ordinary language like play, I think there's all these ways in which people could make assumptions about what play is. And in, in some ways you and I are like really doing what Gadamer is describing, which is mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of conditions by which different kinds of things happen when you're engaged in this kind of dialectical, dialogical play. And I think that's what's important about a Gadamer's hermeneutic approach is that we're really kind of showing these components that are that are key to kind of that choreography having a certain kind of momentum or it being directed in a certain kind of way toward a dynamic that generates something. So I think I think that's why I'm asking about it, even though it's very abstract, because I think people make all kinds of analogies about what play means or what play feels like or even friendship and play. But those analogies are just analogies. I think when we're talking about what Gadamer means, I think there is something really theoretically very important about how it's described in this way, um, because then it becomes a resource for new kinds of play or new kinds of dialogical activity too. Mm -hmm. And again, that's where that's where philosophers become translators of theory into new practices. Um, yeah. So is there an ethical component to this? Is there is there um, an ethical side to this kind of dialogical work? Yeah, so um, and this is this is really what I focused on in my old academic book that I wrote a freaking decade ago. Oh my gosh, it's good stuff. That. It's um, good stuff. But I, I liked, I, I was really interested in the ethical dimensions of dialogue in Gadamer. And yes, this kind of dialogue play is not, as you said, just frivolous. Um, there's a seriousness to it, to it, and there are certain commitments that the dialogue partners make in order for um, the conversation to, to operate well. <laughs> um, so for instance, the, the dialogue partners um, make a commitment to each other um, in that, you know, when I'm, when I'm in conversation with you, I make a commitment to listening with a kind of openness to what you say and with a kind of goodwill. Um, um, I'm trying to understand what you're saying. I'm taking you seriously as making a claim to some kind of truth. And I'm, you know, open to learning from you, open even to finding out that I'm wrong. I mean, that's a really important part of it. Like the, this commitment to revising my ideas um, when I learn that I need to, you know. Um, and, you know, showing the other dialogue partner respect, you know, they, they have their wisdom that they've acquired through their life experience, their study and that kind of thing that you can learn from. So there's a commitment to the other person in dialogue. And then there's also a commitment to truth. And I, I also think these, you could just derive, you could really derive this from Plato. Um, but the other commitment is to truth. Um, you're, you're not trying to beat the other person in an argument or win a debate. You're not trying to uh, manipulate the other person so they'll agree to do something or that's agree so, with you. That's so much part of our media space. If you think about it, right. that's a lot of the conversations that go on either on social media or on, you know, right. TV and that kind of stuff, news media. And, um, and, and like also really importantly, you're not trying to diagnose the other person as like mm -hmm. having some mental illness, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're instead, um, your your goal is is a better understanding of the truth of the matter with the other person so you have to you have to commit to that goal um and this goes back to to plato's or socrates the character for socrates distinction between philosophers and sophists you know philosophers um suppo you know are supposed to be the ones that commit to discovering the truth even if that means they find out they were wrong and sophists are the ones committing to winning the debate um, for 
honor and money or what you know whatever they mm. power political power maybe right um, and that this is a really important distinction. And, you know, there weren't a lot of philosophers in the Greek world, and there aren't a lot of them today either. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, it's a continued struggle to, to, you know, find other people who want to commit to higher understanding as the goal and not to um, overpowering you in a, in a debate or something. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, as you were describing that too, I think it's worth there's two components that I find really powerful and really important potentially in this way of talking about it as an ethical, you know, part of the ethics of it, these commitments um, to those dialogical others, to those dialectical partners. And one is decision-making. Um, I think when you're in a corporate or academic environment, decisions are not made, you know, in these collective ways where you're in dialogue about something and you're playing with ideas and you're then going to make a decision about something, right? Um, in the class, I taught it as consensus. We don't do a lot of practicing of consensus building. We, we try to debate and persuade, right? But there's a kind of sophist quality to that. And it, that's rewarded in a lot of academic environments and corporate environments too, right? The sales pitch. I'm going to persuade you that my pitch is a good pitch. But the idea of consensus building activity where you're engaged in the decision making or even like a democratic engagement where people are trying to grapple with problems. Um, you know, I see this in like when my local board of ed meetings and people stand up and they talk about the issues that they see and try to appeal to this board you know, for services for their kids or for how the money gets spent in the budget. And that quality of risk is still there, but the, the idea that we're going to be improved by this exchange <laughs> is lost. And there is a certain amount of what I call cover your ass syndrome, which is that lack of commitment to truth, right? But I also like the other elements of this besides that decision-making possibility that can come with this. It's like, consensus building quality of this dialogue is the idea that you can dismantle the idea that the expert or the authority is the source of, of, you know, the end point, right? The, that we're supposed to be experts at something or only the experts can engage in these kinds of discussions that I think what's nice about this model is that anyone with dialogical partners who are committed in the same kind of way can talk about the meaning of life or talk yeah. about, you know, the, the, the use of their taxes or whatever practical or, yeah. or, or speculative issue they have. I think what's nice about that is it says that we don't have to rely on the expert to make those, to, to make those evaluations or to diagnose and to explain something. That yeah. There's, and there's it's an not openness that to that. It's not that experts aren't um, valuable contributors to the conversation. Right. They are. I mean, we live in a world right now that is phobic about experts and science and scientists and things like that. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying we should not include the experts in that conversation, but, right. but that, you know, for instance, um, um, an expert's commitment in a conversation when it would involve speaking in a way that is understandable to the non-experts and this this would be straight up you know so socratic commitment to you know speak in speak in words that are known to us both you know yeah. um uh and you know pausing to make sure our partners and friends are are with us at each step of the way of the conversation before we go on i mean that that those are the kinds of commitments that experts could make um to, to, you know, make their contributions more valuable and avoid this, you know, um, sense that they're dominating the, the, the conversation. It, you know, implicit in Gaudamerian dialogue, um, which is, you know, rooted in traditional Socratic dialogue, yeah. um, the partners are, um, are, supposed to be in a kind of power relationship where they're where things are evened out and uh, to a certain extent um they can both partners can reveal their own experiences to each other try out different points of view you know speak sincerely um the goal the goal of the conversation is like an enhanced a, a mutual enhanced understanding um but you know the goal of 
diagnosing or pathologizing the other is quite different because in that case, if you're the doctor, you are seeing the speech of the other as an expression of some sickness that you're trying to figure out, you're trying to diagnose what it is. Um, you're standing back outside of the conversation as the doctor in a position of authority, observing, objectifying the other in a certain sense, um, no longer taking their claims seriously as, as, as claims, of, claims to truth, but as expressions of their psychosis or expressions of their pathology. Um, and you're not, you're no longer yourself immersed in the conversation. And so there, I mean, there's a real reciprocality to the nature of the dialogue play that we've been talking about and philosophical dialogue. Um, and I think that that's a big reason clients are drawn to philosophical counseling is because it, it creates this real kind of human to human bond that, that is harder to get in a, um, scenario where you're being diagnosed. Yeah. Um, and they're able to get a kind of friendship um, uh, situation um, yeah. in philosophical counseling that they can't really get in psychotherapy. And I also think that there are many psychotherapists who do a very collaborative, non-objectifying style of psychotherapy, but but I think that's because they're utilizing philosophical methodology, not modern psychological um, medical yeah. science. Um, so yeah. I, I think too, you know, the, where, where what you describe, and again, where it deviates from traditional psychotherapy or, or traditional methods of this kind of, you know, uh, talk, talk uh, work, right? With talk therapies. Um, is also this management of uncertainty. And I think when you have dialogical partners, like you said, that power is evenly distributed. It has something to do with the management of uncertainty in a way that if you're in a therapeutic setting, in some ways that uncertainty is assumed to not be on the side of the expert. The expert is supposed to clarify or mm -hmm. to confirm or mm -hmm. to settle some mm -hmm. things. And again, there's a lot of saviorism built into that too, that mm -hmm. somehow like the doctor, um, that saviorism, and it's built on a history of white supremacy. This is not to be, um, there's not, I don't think, I don't think it's worth not saying about that history being a white European history of caretaking of how one is cared for. And that's why I think it's nice to talk about psychotherapy, traditional psychotherapy being a compliment to, or kind of as one role to play amongst other ways in which one can take care of oneself. One can also engage in care of others. Mm -hmm. Philosophy, it's finding good questions that become really important to answer, but not because you have the answer or you're secretly hiding the answer. I think that was what Socrates was always accused of, right? That somehow you know, what would he say? He, he was he, being ironic. He yeah, wasn't, he's, he wasn't he's giving like, the you, answer. Are you messing with us, Socrates? Yeah. You know, you keep yeah. doing this, you're going to die, right? And of course he does. But yeah. um, but that he would always yield back and say, no, it's it's not me. This is really, if we're going to seek out the truth, it's the truth that's the problem. We don't know what it is. And, and again, that kind of sincerity in the inquiry is so key to philosophy that I think when you're in a therapeutic setting, there always is this little bit of like feeling like you're being tested when you're in a therapeutic setting, yeah. like that there is a certain kind of progress that you're supposed to be making in a therapeutic environment, which for philosophers, we know that sometimes there is no progress. We made it worse because we've <laughs> asked a question that makes it so much more complicated, but it's truthful. That's the thing is now that we've asked the question, we realize that that really the thing that we thought it was once we've asked this question, we realize it's really not about that anymore. It's really about this. Yeah. And, and that is a kind of is. progress, Jen, even though it feels like it's, it's a philosopher's progress. progress. It's a philosopher's <laughs> progress, which is different than, um, than a therapeutic idea of progress. It may be you're not feeling better, but you're knowing better. You're understanding better. I think you're um, willing to take on uncertainty better. Again, yeah. the idea that there is something life affirming about putting vocabulary about around things that are your worst fears, are the most anxiety producing, that we're not trying to reduce your anxiety, 
in some ways, amplifying anxiety so that we can learn from it. So we can take instruction from it. So we can find out what is at the root of it, you know, the existential stuff. And what if you had a friend to take on uncertainty with? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> or, or two but or three. I think, <laughs> I think, or two or three. I mean, and I think that's what these philosophical friendships are about. And the nice um, thing too about philosophy is it's not just in real time friends, because then you also have Plato as a friend or Aristotle yeah. as a friend or uh, these books are your philosophy friends, friends. My, yeah. my, my sculptures of my philosophy friends. Yeah. That's what I did. I thought, you know what? They're my friends now. I'm going to put them in with me. I'm going to keep them, keep them around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think um, I, I, I'm having just a wrap up thought or whatever, but I, I think that what this shows us is that there's this nice like cyclical relationship between the theoretical philosophy that we've um, studied in school and, and written our books about and the practical, um, um, you know, relationships we have with other people and the, 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 just the practice of being in the trenches with these questions, with others trying to improve life and um, that practice makes our theory better too, because it's actually now based on something we really experienced and, and vice versa, vice versa, as our theory gets clearer, that informs our practice There's a very Aristotelian idea here, a relationship between theory and practice and very hermeneutical, um, circle kind of, um, um, idea too. But, um, anyway, I think, I think I, uh, uh part of, I think the purpose of these, these, interviews is to sort of encourage um, philosophers to, you know, take their theory on the road, so to speak, you know, um, start practicing it in some yeah. way that, that, that has a really concrete um, application. I think it's hugely valuable and very rewarding. I, I agree. I think I've, we've been doing this long enough in the way that we've been doing it, not just the way we've been taught to do it, but in this style of doing it, that is that idea of leisure activity. It really is this, when you say take it on the road, I mean, you think of when you go on vacation, when people go exploring and, and that philosophy is a leisure activity. It's not work and it shouldn't be labor. And I think when we do many practical things, there are a lot of things that make it like dry toast. You know, there's no, um, it's a, it's a necessity to get through and to get to the next, whatever that is. Um, but those mundane practicalities, I find that philosophy as this kind of leisure activity is playful, it's it's political, it's but it's also an oasis. It's also like a, 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 a place to shelter for a little while when the meanness of life really starts kicking in. And it adds a kind of um, satisfaction that I don't get from my every day, every day. It is like a little well, vacation. It's, it's a place for freedom. It's a place to freely adventure with these ideas and creatively play them out in practice um, and revise them as needed, you know, to improve your own life. Um, I and think that's and the reclaim, spirit of it. Right. Reclaim yeah. some of that alienating quality of uh, a society that is harmful, that sometimes you need to be on defensive and you need to be prepared and you need to be protective over your interests because, because those are being taken from you, whether you like it or not, and not by any particular people. It's kind of the system. The system is one in which it will withdraw and not return on investment. And so I think this is where we are doing stuff that is an alternative to that, that can provide some reclaiming, um, quenching the thirst when one is thirsty, you know, kind of thing um, that I also think is nice about this kind of work. Um, and again, we are in this way also showing that what's possible by doing these kinds of interviews. I like this yeah. um, uh, model. We continue, right? We're going to keep going. Well, you're, you're up next. You'll have to think of what our, our next few topics will be. I could, I could, I could talk all day. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we'll have to we'll have to plan and strategize for next time i look okay. forward to so it this is this is our our thing and, we, and again look forward to seeing what we do next okay 